on a family holiday this time um, so I saw some of my family down and um, yeah we kind of based ourselves in Phuket after Christmas and um, I went to Dubai to do New Year's Eve and then came came back um, so I had one other show in Thailand and then we're yeah, doing Shipsomia so this is my last show I've got to leave tomorrow um, I don't sleep no um, I don't know technology allows me to do a lot of things that I couldn't do 10 years ago so, um, in the, you know, 10 years ago, I would have had to be in a radio studio doing radio shows all the time. And now I can build the shows on my laptop and um, the quality now of what, what I can do from home or when I'm traveling has, has gone up. So, um, the only downside is not, it's not always live. You know, and I, and I, my whole career was built around live radio, but um, I did that for a long time. So. Um, not really. Not really. I mean, it was. Um, I was very young when I first got a break to go onto Radio One, and um, at the time, I was not not for long out of school. I didn't. I never went to university, and I thought I was just gonna. I used to go up to Radio One on a weekly basis and be a guest on someone else's show, and I thought it was gonna be really easy to then just get my own show, but it wasn't. I, I, it took me ten years to get back there um, before I got a regular spot but I always thought it was going to be my destiny and I eventually got onto there with my own show in, in 1991 which was obviously the peak of the whole kind of rave, rave scene and the acid house scene and the start of the club scene as we know it today and I, I wasn't thinking too far into the future at that point I didn't think that I would still be doing it 20 plus years later um, so, so it's been a pretty incredible journey. Like the vinyl, um, I never sold it. It's, it's unfortunately it's been moved around different storage facilities for pretty much 20 years. There's no house big enough, but I, I sometimes think I should have just sold it, and now I'm kind of glad I kept it. But I've probably paid for it 30 times over the amount of storage costs. But currently, it's in London, and I'm thinking about moving it to LA. So it's like a museum. <laughs> um, that's why I kept it. I mean, there was a moment when I was going to sell all the 12 inches. And I'm glad I didn't because those are the only things you really can't get now. Like all the albums, everything got digitalized. So all the really rare like jazz funk records and Japanese imports we used to fight over. Everything like that got made available, but all the 12 inches are really difficult. All the B-sides, all the acapellas and all the beats tracks, they're, they're all vanished. So um, that's where the real value is. Well, it depends. I think it was a what started as a journalistic term in America to just avoid saying rave or dance or um, club <laughs> or electronica. Um, they, came, they came up with something else. Uh, so originally, seven, eight years ago, it was, just a, it, was a, it was the mother of all genres, but it rapidly became associated with um, a very specific style and it became associated with the most successful DJs in America, um, which were mostly from Europe. So it, it became almost a, a, it's almost like disco. It's like the pop, the pop version of electronic music, the, ver the version that was most popular. So, and, then, and therefore after time, it, it eventually becomes, um, it has a stigma that, you know, the underground guys don't want to be associated with. So, um, that's that's what it, that's the story. That's like anything, though. It's like probably the, the, the original disco DJs were pretty cool until it got cheesy. <laughs> I don't think that um, I have nothing wrong with that. That's just normal to me. I, I, I you know, I, I have help when I make music, and I always credit the people. I try and credit the people. Um, I think it's just got a bit confused where you know DJs used to play other people's records in the right order. And that's what DJs did. And then DJs got to make music. And it was hard, you know, when I started in the 80s, it was hard to make music because you had to get a studio, you had to get someone to pay for it. So the right, you know, the, the cost of entry was so difficult, so high. And then obviously technology takes over and eventually everyone can do it in a laptop. And, and then this is where the confusions come because 
certain DJs have become very famous. And in the new era of what a DJ means, I guess, you know, if you ask my 10 year old daughter, nine year old daughter, what a DJ is, she'll, she'll, she'll probably say David Getter before she'll say daddy, I don't know. And, and people are associating D, the word DJ almost immediately means um, Avicii or pop stars or something. So I think that when they find out that some of those DJs who are like pop stars have other people to help them, um, that's where the, the, the ghost producer things come in. Depends how how f real or false you're being about it, I guess, you know. If, if you're crediting everyone all the time or you're saying in interviews, I make music with this guy. I mean, it didn't seem so long ago it wasn't a problem, but it became a big problem, I guess, when certain people were saying they did it. It's, it's, just, when you, it's just when you say you're all doing it all yourself <laughs> and then you find out two years later that actually it was someone else. So that's, that's where the issue is. Depends. So it's about openness, really. But I don't think people should be... You know, collaboration in music is everything. I mean, when you think about something like Jack Q, you know, Skrillex and Diplo and their army of people. I mean, every everybody, you know, um, and even all, all, all the pop ones, you know, they all collaborate. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether Zed does everything in the studio. He's still going to get Selena Gomez or someone to come in and do the vocal. I don't know, but you know, Justin Bieber. So it's, um, you know, Jack Hughes have obviously been probably the one of the most significant success stories of 2015. And all credit to them because they kind of they've moved the needle and they've moved the story on. But yeah, how what would have you know the smartest thing they did was was convince J Justin Bieber to sing the song. So yeah, no, it's been good. It's been nothing but good. The fact that you still ask me a question about it and it was made um, so long ago, 2000 or whatever. Um, no, it became notorious, and um, I wish we could do another one. We some of the creative team have talked about it. Um, we're just coming up trying to come up with the right story, but it's it definitely was the right thing to do at the right time, caught people's imagination. Ironically, it came out when one of the last Star Wars came out, you know, the, the one, two, three sequence, and we got buried in theaters when it was released, but it after, you know, thanks, thanks to DVD and everything, it became a kind of cult film, so. Time.